Smyrna is a, is a town. And the, the main product, the main uh, industry there was uh, the production of myrrh. It was a crystal, uh, a crystal of myrrh, which was used in those days. It was the major export from Smyrna, myrrh. You remember? It was used as an ingredient for pain. When Jesus was dying on the cross, they gave him wine vinegar mixed with myrrh. And uh, when, when Jesus was born, the, there were wise men brought gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Myrrh was used a lot during the, the days of Jesus. And uh, when Jesus was in the tomb, remember, the ladies went there to put some fragrant things there. What was one of them? Myrrh. So myrrh was used. God's promises to Smyrna that he will remove their pain. God promises Smyrna they will re remove their pain. You know, many of us who go through pain, we wonder when is it going to all end? It's not going to end. He's promised to go with us through it. Smyrna is 35 miles north of Ephesus. Last week, Pastor Rod had taken you to Ephesus. And this week, I'm going to take you 56 kilometers north to Smyrna, located on the west coast of the Aegean Sea in, the west, in western Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey. So let's listen to a few. Just watch this. Someone's going to give us a few more insights into Smyrna. Next stop on our list, Smyrna. Smyrna, an ancient city now surrounded by the modern Turkish city of Izmir, was originally established around 1000 BC. Greek settlers established old Smyrna on this small peninsula jutting out into the Aegean Sea. Now it was in old Smyrna that the famous Greek poet Homer, author of the Iliad and the Odyssey, was born around 850 BC. History tells us that a shrine to Homer stood in the city during the Roman period. After the time of Alexander the Great in the late 4th century BC, New Smyrna was built by the Seleucids along the coast and up these slopes of Mount Pagus. Now this region eventually developed into Asia province during the Roman period and Smyrna, strategically located between Ephesus to the south and Pergamum to the north, developed into a wealthy port city. In fact, it was one of the most important cities of the entire province with a population of nearly 100,000 residents. During the Roman period, ancient historians said that Smyrna was a city of great beauty and impressive architecture that circled Mount Pegasus like a crown. There was a great harbor, a massive agora, and a theater on the northwest mountain slope that could hold 20,000 people. This wealthy city was also known for its exceptionally good wine. Smyrna was severely damaged by an earthquake in 178 AD, but was quickly rebuilt. Now the layout of the city we see here today and most of these structures are pretty much the same as they were in the late first century when John was writing. Here's a portion of John's second letter in the book of Revelation. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Revelation 2, 8 through 10. Wasn't that a lovely description? I know you must have been enjoying being on, the, on those mountain slopes with our speaker, and he's taken you to, to Smyrna. Now that you're at Smyrna, better come back to where you are in your lounge room now. And let's go on with the Word of God. 
Actually, Smyrna was a, a, a wonderful church. Smyrna and Philadelphia are the two churches that got some great commendation from the master who asked John to write these words to the churches. And so he, he writes here in verse 8, chapter 2, Revelation 2, verse 8, uh, Jesus says to John, write this, write this letter to the angel of the church in Smyrna. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who was dead and is now alive. Never forget this. It is the risen, ascended, and active Jesus, the Savior of the church, the Savior of the world speaking here. So he's risen, he's ascended, he's active, he's still speaking, and John sees him and hears him. And he's walking in the midst of the church. You know, very often we think, where is God? He's right there. Doesn't matter what we're going through, even as individuals or as a church, Jesus is right in the midst where we are. In, we read that in, uh, in chapter 2 and verse 1. We, we looked at that last time. But also in, in chapter 1 and verse 14, he has penetrating eyes. He can see beyond what we can see. And that's the wonder, wonder about him. He knows all about his church. He knows all about Smyrna when he asks John to write this to the church. He also knows all that is happening in in their society, and that's why he asked John to write it. But when I compare what's happening in Smyrna, I also find that it's no different to what's happening today, or any other church for that matter. When we think about the church today in our world, no matter what country we go to or what city we live in, the church is still the church of Jesus, and it's put right in the middle of society. And what happens in society is, has a bearing on the church, but the church is called for something. So hang in there. John addresses the church in Smyrna. Notice, he, just, he addresses the church in Smyrna. He doesn't say, to the churches in Smyrna. Oh, what does that say to me? It said to me that they were one, united, as a church body. Tremendous. I'm going to, I'm going to challenge every church to be united but I'm going to challenge Beaconsfield Baptist Church to be united in everything. Remember that Smyrna was surrounded by paganism and godlessness all around. No different today that nobody wants to hear about God or hear about Jesus. Jesus is a swear word to many people. But I tell you, it's the most wonderful word. There's no name like the name of Jesus. And so when we look at the church... God plants the church in the midst of all the paganism, in the midst of all godlessness, and he expects his church to be the light, to be that single beam of light in the midst of all the darkness. And my prayer is that Beaconsfield Baptist Church, we as a church family, will be that light placed here in our society, that each of us here as individuals in your homes will be put there for a definite purpose, that you will be the light to your community in the midst of all the darkness. That's what John is writing here, and that's what came from the, our master, Jesus. Write this letter to the angel. He also says, this is the message from the one who is the first and the last. The church in Smyrna claimed Jesus as their Lord, but they lost everything in the process. They got nothing in return. You know, Jesus never promises. And I know there are some who say, come to Jesus and everything will be fine. Come to Jesus and you'll be wealthy. That's all not true. Jesus never said that. Jesus said, come. <laughs> come and suffer. <laughs> it's a church of suffering. Smyrna is the church of suffering. They're going, going, going through a lot of pain. They were presently poor, humanly speaking. Wealth-wise, they were poor. They were ostracized by the community. They were abused by the community. And today, it's no different. The church is still poor compared to society. The church is still ostracized by society, by the world around that we live in. And the church is also abused today. How, how much? When, when we see that happening and we saw, see that happen to Smyrna, we should rejoice. 
That's what the master wants us to do. Because he is the first and the last. He was dead, but is now alive. So we serve a risen Savior. You know that song? I serve a risen Savior. Yes, Suzanne's going to play it for us one day. <laughs> I serve a risen Savior. I don't serve a dead God. My God is alive. What about yours? It's, a cost, it's costly to follow Jesus 24-7. You know, many Christians follow Jesus on a Sunday. But when they go out there, they follow their own way. My prayer is that everyone listening today will not be like that, but that we will be following Jesus like the church at Smyrna 24-7. Let's go to verse 9. Here we notice that Jesus wants to give some encouragement, and he also gives them an endorsement. In verse 9 he says, I know about your suffering. So when we're going through something, let's remember Jesus knows about it even before we go through it. I know about your suffering. I know about your poverty. But you are rich. Turn to your neighbor and say, did you know that we are rich? Did you know that we are rich? I'm looking at the friends here, only three of them. <laughs> yes, we are rich. Hallelujah. Because Jesus said it. I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they are not because their synagogues belong to Satan. Not my words, the words of the risen Lord who is alive, telling John to write this to the church at Smyrna. I know your tribulation. I know your suffering. Some translations use the word tribulation. I know your suffering. The word tribulation means pressure. How many of us say, how are you today? Oh, I'm under a lot of pressure. I've heard people say that. Well, change it to tribulation. I'm under a lot of tribulation. I'm under a lot of suffering. Good, recognize it. Because the word literally means crushing beneath the weight. I want to stop there for a moment and ask you this morning. Is there a weight that is crushing you? Only you can answer that. I can't. But if that weight is crushing you this morning, I want you to know that the Lord of the church, the Lord of your life, says, I know that pressure. I know that tribulation. I know that suffering. The pressure on the church at Smyrna. And the, seeking, the pressure on the church there was seeking to crush the Christian life out of them. If you, look at, if you study that church more closely, we don't have the time to do it today. But if you look at that church a little bit, they were being pressured in every way, every possible way, to seek to crush the life out of them. But I want to say to the church at Beaconsfield, and I want to say to any church listening this morning, that the Lord is in the midst of his church. He's got his eye on his church. Help us to be faithful, Lord. He says, I know your poverty. Now, you may be a church, and we may be a church. We'd love to have more money. I'm sure my treas our treasurer would say yes. But I tell you something, the Lord understands that. He says he knows our poverty. The word poverty described here is absolute hardship and utter, utter destitution. I don't think any of us have understand that. You need to go to some of these countries where people don't have anything. This last week I came, I was called and someone told me of someone who's living in their car and didn't, uh, didn't have anything. I felt so sad when I heard all that, and I thought I must do something. He has no home, nowhere to go, sleeps in his car, has no one to help him. I, I, I was devastated. We'd, we'd, we've taken some action, we're trying to help him. And uh, maybe the next time I preach, I'll say, God answered prayer, please pray for him. And, and you know, the worst thing was that uh, he even got a, uh, a fine for being out in his car because he has nowhere else to go. Well, praise the Lord. I pray that that fine will be paid for him. Verse 9 says, I know your suffering. I know the poverty. I know what you're going through. But remember, you're rich. He knows our poverty. He knows our destitution. But we are rich. I want you to remember that every time you're going through pressure, say, thank God he has made me rich we're not talking about the worldly goods. We're talking about rich in spirit, rich in soul, 
excited to be. I hope I'm excited this morning. I am. In spite of extreme suffering at the hands of their Jewish persecutors, the saints were faithful. That's what the Lord is calling us to be. Faithful people who will follow him regardless of what the circumstances are. We are faithful. Thirdly, he knows your perse persecutors. The second part of that verse says, they say they are Jews, but they are not because their synagogues belong to Satan. And I, I, when we look at this, the religious Jews of the day who claim to be the seed of Abraham, spiritually they were of Satan and under his power and control. You know, many times the, the, I've come across many Christians who say, we're following Jesus, but their lives don't show it. Jesus said, by their fruit, you will know them. And that's why the Lord of the church is telling Smyrna, don't worry about those around you who claim to be sons of Abraham. He says, I know them, the religious Jews who claim to be the seed of Abraham. Spiritually, they were from Satan, he says, and under his power and control. These are the words of the master. Verse, verse 33 um, I want you to look at verse 33 of John chapter 8. When Jesus was among them, he says, but, but they said to Jesus, we are the descendants of Abraham. They said, we have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will set us free? You can read the whole chapter. But verse 34 says, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. So Jesus had a confrontation with these same Jewish people that the church at Smyrna now is under pressure with. And in, in, but putting that into context, the Jews thought they were the sons of Abraham. In, in Numbers chapter 16 and verse 3, you can read it up. But Israel, or the Jews, are called the congregation of the Lord. But here, Christ calls these unbelieving Jews, when he's asking John to write to the church at Smyrna, the congregation of Satan. You can cross-check that in John chapter 8, verse 33 onwards. But in chapter 8 and verse 44, we read these words. For you are, Jesus' words, you are the children of your father, the devil. And you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character. I like that. It's consistent. So when Satan comes to give you a lie, he whispers in your ear, remember, he's consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. One translation says, from the very beginning, which is true. He lied from the very beginning. Let's, let's move on, otherwise I won't finish today. Smyrna was the home of a large Jewish community hostile towards Christians. They didn't want to follow Christ. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. They were slanderous in their accusations. They accused the Christians of so many things that led to persecution in the end. Christians were persecuted by Roman authorities. In Acts chapter 14, verses 2 and 19, and in Acts chapter 17, verse 13, there are many more verses in between there. You, you look it up. You'll find there that Paul and Barnabas, preaching in the synagogue at Iconium in, the, in that passage, great number of both Jews and Greeks became believers through their preaching of Jesus as the Lord. Some of the Jews, however, spurned God's message and poisoned the minds of the Gentiles against Paul and Barnabas, right there in the Acts of the early church. But the apostles stayed there a long time, the scriptures tell us there in Acts, preaching boldly about the grace of the Lord. And my prayer is as long as God gives me breath, I want to keep on preaching as long as he gives me breath, boldly, that Jesus is the Lord and there's no other Lord, no one but him. I wish this place was full so you can all say, hallelujah, I missed that in my preaching. But I'm sure you're saying it now. But the apostles stayed there a long time preaching boldly about the grace of the Lord. But in verse 4 there it says, But the people of the town were divided in their opinion about them. This is Acts I'm talking about. 
Acts chapter 14. In verse 4 it says, And some of them sided with the Jews, and some of them with the apostles. Then the mob of the Gentiles and the Jews, along with all their leaders, decided to attack and stone Paul and Barnabas. You know, I've never been stoned yet, but I've had all sorts of things done and said about me, that's fine. It was said and done about Jesus too, my Lord and my Savior. So don't worry about what anyone says. Stay true to the Master. Listen to His voice. Obey Him like the church at Smyrna was doing. I, finish, I go on to verse 10. I'm going to finish off now. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days, but if you, rema if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Hallelujah. So many things in this passage making me shout hallelujah. It's not because I, I, I planned to say that. It's not in my notes. But like my heart rejoices that Jesus has promised to be with us. Take those words, 10 days. What does that mean? It's confused many people. And there are so many interpretations and translations for it and so many instances that you bring. I want to bring one today. Perhaps it refers to the 10 persecutions that the church at Smyrna faced that began with Nero and concluded with Diocletian at the end of the third century. So in that period, there were 10 persecutions on the church and the churches in that region. Christians are not promised to be sheltered from persecution. If you're thinking, oh, we're going to have a, a wonderful life. No, my friends. He's called us to a life to suffer with for his namesake. It's not going to be easy. But they are kept. And through their persecution, he has promised to be there. But if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Jesus will never leave us nor forsake us. He's promised that. I've proved that in my life. <clears throat> I'm sure some of you can say that. Amen. Amen. He's always with us. Let me remind you again of Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. That's what this verse 10 led me to. Don't love money, but satisfy, be satisfied with, with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. So I will never fear. What can mere people do to me? Don't fear. Literally, the words are fear nothing. You know, in this pandemic, epidemic, whatever you want to call it, coronavirus, COVID-19. I want to say this to you. Just sail through it with the Lord being there. Regardless of what we face, don't grumble, don't complain. Just say, the Lord gave, the Lord took away. Blessed be his name. Who said those words? You find out. I'm not going to tell you. Someone who went through more suffering than any one of us have. No matter how small or how severe the, the suffering, the, on, the one who has overcome death says, fear nothing. Jesus, they would cast your, cast your burdens. You could cast your burdens on the Lord because he cares for you. I've given you three scriptures in the notes there. Philippians chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 5, and Isaiah 14, 10. That's for your takeaway, homework. I want to cl conclude this morning with the last part of that verse. Jesus commends them for their spiritual wealth. You may be poor financially, may be poor with other things of this world, but remember this, you are rich, he says. He commends them for their spiritual wealth. Where are you this morning? How rich are you in spiritual things? How rich are you in spiritual things? This is what it says. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. Very wonderful these words are. It has come at last. Salvation and power and the kingdom of our God. And the authority of his Christ. 
for the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. So be fearless in living for Jesus. Be faithful to him and his word and trust him and you see the great things that will happen because there is a crown of life awaiting for all those who are fearless and faithful. Awaits for all those who will remain faithful to the end. So be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. There are many Christians, many churches today in other countries who are being persecuted for their faithfulness to Jesus, some of them through death. And yet they'll never give up. They'll never deny that they're still faithful to the end. The final verse is verse 11. The triumph of Christ is promised to us. Christ's message to the church in Smyrna is the same as it is to the church today. Anyone with ears to hear, I hope you've heard it, must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. Someone said, if you're born once, you'll die twice. But if you're born twice, you'll only die once. Let me explain that. If you're born physically, then you'll die physically. And if you've never been born spiritually, you'll die spiritually. That's the second death. But if you're born physically and be born again spiritually, then there's only one death, this physical body, but we'll never die again. Hallelujah. To all of you who know Jesus, praise the Lord. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. What a great word to the church at Smyrna. What a great word to the, ch the suffering church at Smyrna. What a great word to the suffering church at Beaconsfield. You know why? Many of you have told me, I wish we could be there. Suffer through it now and be faithful. Hallelujah. <laughs> Father, I thank you for your saints this morning. I ask a special blessing upon everyone in the sound of my voice. I pray, Lord, that we will receive your word with gladness and we live out your word with joy this coming week. That like the church at Smyrna, we will be the faithful, suffering church in the midst of all that we face, yet the joyful light in the midst of our society to shine as Jesus shone. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.